welcome back to the 2018 We Don't Have Time Climate Conference. Now, Julia, are you ready for some action? You don't have to ask that question. Of course I am. We have learned that the climate crisis is real, but also that there are solutions. And now we need to act together. We have reached the third and last segment of this conference, Actions for a Global Climate Movement. And here we will focus on how to raise awareness globally and how to bring real change uh, in order to make the climate not change too bad, of course. And how do we reach out to politicians, business leaders and corporations with demand for climate action? And how do we effectively communicate and implement the solutions of the crisis? This segment will last until approximately a quarter past seven CET. And please do join the conversation by asking questions and posting comments uh, on Twitter using the hashtag, we don't have time. We are running out of time. Right now, carbon dioxide emissions are being released at a staggering rate. Climate change will soon be self-fulfilling and unstoppable. The ice in the Arctic will no longer deflect sunlight, and the Siberian tundra is melting while releasing enormous quantities of methane gas into the atmosphere. We cannot turn the clock back. We are growing closer at an unprecedented speed to the point of no return. But there is still time to stop the emissions. So why do we not introduce a carbon dioxide tax now? Why is it we are not shifting to 100% renewable energies? How is it that nothing is being done? We have a solution. Right now as we speak, we are building a social network, an arena where you and millions of people around the world will be able to watch who is really doing something to put an end to the climate crisis. An arena where you can look into what your politicians and business leaders are doing about climate change. Do they in fact take it seriously? Are they doing their job? Love bomb the ones in power that are actively looking for solutions and climate bomb the ones that must do more. Nobody likes a bad rating. Nobody wants to be held accountable for the climate crisis. When the pressure is felt by the people in power, they will no longer be able to deny, mislead, or hide. They will have to change their ways. This is a time when together we can solve this crisis, a time of great change. We are working round the clock to create this social network. But you don't have to wait for us. At wedonthavetime.org, you can already send climate bombs, love bombs, and messages to chosen world leaders through social media. Remember, together we have the power, but we are running out of time. And now we are happy to present our first keynote speaker of this segment, Mr. Ingmar Rensog himself. Ingmar is a climate reality leader and an entrepreneur. Please do. Ingmar is a climate re reality leader and an entrepreneur he, with a background in finance and communications. We is also the founder and CEO of We Don't Have Time, the host of this event. Please hear Ingmar Rensog. Thank you, Martin. What we have seen so far in this conference is that the severity of the climate crisis is grave and urgent. But we also have seen a lot of hope. Hope in the form of a growing movement of people and business working on amazing solutions. But we need to hurry up to implement these solutions. There will come a tipping point when the effects of climate change become self-fulfilling and irreversible. What is absolutely and undeniable important is that we together reach an awareness tipping point before we reach the climate tipping point. And we believe that we can reach that awareness tipping point in time by joining the forces and the voices of all of us who care on one joint social media platform, whose sole focus is climate change, and that platform is we don't have time.org. Our goal is to build the world's biggest social media platform focused on climate change so that our members could be the change by the power of many. Right now, we're working around the clock to build this network. We're not done, but with the launch today, you can actually sp start spreading the word and use our social media action tools and help us by sharing the hashtag we don't have time. 
on our site, you can react to the world leaders on Twitter and send climate love to those who actually lead by example and climate bomb to those who really need to wake up. Your, our community can send a loud bang, the climate bomb. It's not a message of hate nor a threat. It's a sincere plea to wake up, change ways and join in. Last but not definitely least, instead of or as a compliment to give me your New Year's resolution, which usually just impacts yourself, why not impact the whole world with your resolution? In line with our launch today, we're launching the Climate Resolution, which is a concept and a tool on our website where you easily can record a video of yourself with your smartphone telling your friends, family and the whole world what you do well today and uh, at the same time what you are willing to do better tomorrow to live more climate friendly. And you can choose to challenge your friends on the internet to do the same. Alone we are weak, together we are strong. If you represent a company or, or on an organization, you could take this opportunity to tell the world what your organization does for the climate and challenge your peers. And I will now show you an example how this actually works. At Van der Fan, we have decided to be fossil free within one generation. That means that we naturally work with our own assets, but we also work to electrify the industry sector. For example, through Hybrid, which is a cooperation with the Swedish steel and mining industries, SSAB and KAB, where we want to make fossil-free steel. But we also work with the transport sector, and it's in that area I would like to settle on a challenge. At Vattenfall, we decided to electrify our entire uh, car fleet, and that means they will all be pure electric or hybrids. I would like to send that challenge on to other companies to do the same. I would like to start with Volvo Cars, one of our cooperating partners. I also like to send it on to Fabio Gay, who is the one from which we are renting uh, our office, and also to McDonald's. Thank you, Ingmar. I'm not. Ready. <laughs> on wedonthattime.org, you can make your own climate resolution. With We Don't Have Time, you will have the power to change the world. Because we don't have time to wait. We need to act now to fight the climate crisis. Thank you. And welcome up, Julia. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Somebody was waving, <laughs> waving at me. <laughs> now, thank you, Ingmar. Let's hope that this climate resolution tool becomes a real hit. And with that, it's time to introduce our panel and other keynote speakers. Uh, with us here in the studio, we will have Daniel Just Lund, that. chairman and co-founder of Aidbox, Helena Lindemark, founder of the 2022 Initiative Foundation, and Erik Hus, member of the advisory board of Plogga. Joining us on Zoom are Smart Chukuma Amufula, CEO of Climate Transform May, uh, Transformations and Energy Remediation Society, Dan Old, co-founder and advisor of Purposeful Money, Maria Mel, director of at uh, Arab Arabesque, and Peter Carter, founder of the Climate Emergency Institute. A, war a warm welcome to all of you. I hope uh, you all are fired up and ready for action. And now let me introduce our next speaker, or let let you introduce our I'll try to do that, <laughs> if I can manage to do that. It's going to be Elizabeth, Wo Elizabeth Woodworth, and uh, that will be our second keynote for this segment. And um, Elizabeth Woodworth, she is the co-author of Unprecedented Climate Mobilization and co-producer of the COP21 video, A Climate Revolution for All. And she is going to present how the media has stolen our time and game changers for survival through this video clip. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Woodworth, and I live in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. 
And I have recently written a book with Dr. Peter Carter, who also lives in British Columbia. Uh, and the title is Unprecedented Crime, Climate Science Denial and Game Changers for Survival. Uh, we were very fortunate that Dr. James Hansen wrote the foreword for this book. The IPCC is the best source we have about the state of the climate. All national governments and the media have been regularly informed about the climate science consensus since 1990. Governments and the media simply cannot say that they did not know. Governments and the media have known since 1990 that business as usual would cause a devastating future of four degrees centigrade, but the public does not get to know this. The media has an ethical responsibility to report how serious climate change is, but even during the year of the Paris summit, total U.S. reporting was only two hours and 26 minutes. It's a stunning fact that during the hottest U.S. September on record, when 64% of Americans were concerned about global warming, there was not one question on climate change during the election debates. We were not told that the Commission on Presidential Debates is funded by corporations and pays no federal tax. In September 2016, which was the hottest year at that point on record, Pope Francis made an urgent call to protect the people on earth least responsible for climate change, which he called a sin against God. This was not reported, and therefore the public could not be mobilized by his plea. Nor did the media tell us about the worldwide subnational global climate leadership, which is calling to limit warming to below 2 degrees Celsius by 2050. The public was not allowed to know the importance of this target either. This March in Boston, and for the first time, 13 people involved in civil disobedience against a pipeline were found not guilty. In the U.S. and Canada, where pipelines are a huge issue, the public was not allowed to know about this breakthrough from their newspapers or television networks. Several new climate lawsuits are targeting the major oil companies and the American state and federal governments. The first, in Oregon, had been scheduled for last February the 5th, but was stalled by the Trump administration. It now has an October 29th court date. You can donate to this case at the Our Children's Trust website. The Trump administration will not allow its scientific agencies to connect climate change with human activity. What they are saying is that nothing can or should be done about it. Now the NOAA and NASA State of the Climate Reports are not making the regular news. Withholding this information is a willful crime against humanity. Half of our book is devoted to the many low-carbon solutions already in use around the world. However, they are seldom reported in North America's pipeline-obsessed media. We also present an emergency climate restoration plan. To sum up, we are not completely out of time. Global society still has some time to head off catastrophic climate change, but we must act immediately. The Stanford University Climate Solutions Project tells us how to do this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elizabeth. It seems beyond doubt that the media needs to take this threat much more seriously. And I also, I'm happy to tell you that Elizabeth will be joining us live for our panel session later on. We will now present our next keynote speaker. 
Dr. Peter Carter is the founder of the Climate Emergency Institute. He has served as an expert reviewer for the International Panel on Climate Change. He is an expert on climate change issues, especially the implications of global climate change on food security for the world's most vulnerable regions and populations. And Peter has uh, recorded this for us. Hello, everyone. This exciting We Don't Have Time initiative rightly calls for action. Action that focuses on how to raise awareness globally and build a movement that demands change. So how aware are we? After 25 years of international attention to the issue, 40% of adults worldwide have never heard of climate change. More than 65% in some developing countries. This is an enormous opportunity for this initiative. Less than 50% of Americans think climate change is a serious threat. This is incredible. The world badly needs this initiative. We still have to get the basic facts of the climate emergency across to the whole world. Reporting is falling behind on awareness of the catastrophic severity of the issue. It's still being denied, ignored, and downplayed. For carbon dioxide alone, 2017 was a record high for fossil fuel CO2 emissions. The worst of all climate change news ever for the entire world went unreported in 2017. The WMO warned that atmospheric CO2 is at a three to five million year high and it's accelerating at a rate without any past precedent. The same applies to ocean acidification, so there is no more time. These uncomfortable facts are lifelines for our common future survival. Mother Earth is being severely impacted in every way, crying out for an Earth emergency movement. We are all in a dire emergency today. For a future livable climate and for our oceans, which are being hit by accelerating acidification, heating, and deoxygenation. This is a global biodiversity extinction emergency. For all life. It is a world food security emergency for all major crops in all major food producing regions. We need a global movement that demands real change, rapidly effective, radical change for our survival. The 2014 assessment of the IPCC said that the world economy must totally decarbonize, reaching, quote, near zero emissions of carbon dioxide. So the movement has to be a zero combustion energy movement. The awesome new technologies for this are growing fast. Our only future is fossil fuel free. The burning age is over. The new climate mobilization organization in the United States is having success with their city by city project of climate emergency action resolutions to municipal governments calling for cities to lead the race to zero emissions. Our Children's Trust, also in the US, having won every legal roadblock thrown at them, is taking the US government to court in October 2018. And this legal offensive movement has gone global. There are many ways we can support these young people in all countries. An Earth emergency movement will focus on forcing governments to cease subsidizing fossil fuel industries in short order, giving trillions of dollars every year, as the IMF reports, in subsidies to fossil fuel corporations is a monstrous crime. The science is definite. All reports on global greenhouse gas emissions to avoid planetary catastrophes say that global emissions must decline on an immediate basis by 2020 at the very latest. But the national emissions targets of our governments do just the opposite. They lead to substantially greater emissions by 2030. That is a planet killer policy, literally the crime of all time. Changing to near zero emissions means the vital key to our common future survival is conversion, total conversion of all fossil fuel energy, 
conversion of food production. The world is going vegan. The healthiest future for people on the planet is plant-based, meat-free. Conversion of transportation and of the construction industry. Conversion of the war machine into peace and cooperation. This great world rebuild will be the biggest boost to economies and employment ever. No cost, all benefit, and a huge benefit to global health and security. We are in a race against time to cut carbon emissions to near zero through the new zero combustion world economy. We can, we must convert the world to rescue the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carton. Carter. That must have been one of the most powerful statements in a long time. Totally decarbonize the future. That's what we have to do. Yes. And now we would like to present Smart Shakawua Amafula. I'm a little bit scared. I don't think I pronounced the name properly, but he is um, a climate reality leader and the CEO of Climate Transformation and Energy Remed. Society and Smart will, among other topics, talk about food shortage as a result of climate change in Nigeria. Mr. Good, Amafula, good, good. please be uh, our guest. Are you with us? Let's see the. Let's see how the internet is helping us. Smart, can you hear us? He's having problems. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We can hear you. We can see you and hear you. Do you can see you, us? Can you see and hear us, Smart? He's trying to adjust the microphone. Adjusting the oh. microphone. Smart, are you with us? Can you hear us? You need to unmute yourself if you can't hear us. We seem to have some sort of technical fix here. Smart, can you hear us? Now let's come back to Smart in a few minutes. Yeah, let's move on then and hope that we get in touch with Mr. Amafula later on. Uh, I want to remind you, don't forget to uh, tweet questions and comments using uh, the we don't have time hashtag. Uh, time for our next topic. Mm. Uh, money makes the world go round. Some say, well, if money has caused the world to head in the wrong direction, can it make the world right? With us now is Maria Mal. Maria Mal is director of Arabesque, and Maria, you will be presenting what impact the financial community can have. Let's see if we can see and hear you, Maria. Are you there? <coughs> no, this is. <laughs> we're still in Nigeria, I think. Or are we? They am Hello, Maria. Oh, there you are. Can you hear us, Maria? Everybody's got the white walls. Maria, can you hear, can you hear us? us? I can hear you. All right. Yes. Hello. Good morning and good afternoon uh, to everyone in Stockholm and all around the world. Uh, my name is Maria Mal. I'm the director of Arabesque. We're an asset manager and a sustainability data analytics firm. And I'm so pleased to be talking um, in the action segment of, of, of this conference, as we've heard a lot of our uh, previous speaker talking about the importance of taking action and what can be done and what we can do as individuals, but also what the large institutions can do. And coming to the, to the part where finance can play a role, uh, we're now at the stage in time where finance can actually act as a catalyst uh, to drive um, action in the climate action space. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm going to talk about, a little bit about how an institutions uh, can act towards that, pension funds, but also you as individuals uh, can do that. Thank and you. Um, I wanted to, yes, I wanted to start with. Now, let's see. She's about to bring up the presentation we need to say to the viewers. The screen. There yes. we are. There it is. Yes. Perfect. So um, I wanted to ask to start with. Uh, it's just a couple of years old now there where we know that um, where um, where finance can actually play a role and I'm just gonna find my right 
Here we go. Maybe. Nope. Just give me a second here. Because this is an this is an important piece here that I'm going to talk about right now, and it's about how um, how in the past couple of years we finally have what we thought for a very long time, uh, even in the finance community, uh, sustainable investing is something that's been around for about 20 years, and that is looking at ethical investments, how you don't you choose not to invest in. Uh, fossil fuels, nuclear, etc. But for the past couple of years, we've also been able to confirm uh, the business case, um, that is the performance between corporations who perform well on sustainability areas that are important to the core business and sustainability and out of itself and how that can actually drive uh, performance of how, how corporations are operating uh, the risk, the cost of capital, and also their shareholder value. So we now know that it can actually be profitable to for corporations to focus on the sustainability issues, as well as it is for, for people who want to invest their money smarter. So today, there's a good chance that you can actually make money uh, when you integrate and look at how an investing corporations that are doing better. And that is something that is fairly new um, and just just grown over the past couple of years. And that's what we at Arabesque are doing. We're integrating and looking at these corporations who are not just performing well financially, but are also uh, performing well to all the different stakeholders of the world, the environment, social issues, and, and governance issues. And that's also been driving by what we as people are, I mean, just us having this conference today is showing that there's an awareness of these issues and how important they are. So at the same time, where we know that this now can be actually good for corporations to, to not just do well financially, but also care about sustainability issues, we now have an increased pressure from, from individuals, from investors are starting to know, well, I don't want to invest in, in, in corporations or I don't want to invest in mutual funds. They're also investing in, in fossil fuels or corporations that are not good in, in waste water management or, or water management or are not energy efficient. So there are a couple of trends and I mentioned two of them. Uh, first of all, how society is now pushing, the, the more data we have, the more transparencies, transparency um, people are looking at, how their corporations are performing, their, their portfolios, their pensions. Um, the more we know that they're going to put pressure on investment firms to invest better as well. And that is driven by um, a surge in, in millennials caring about this issue. So if you ask millennials today how they want to make their money that they invest, not only, wanna, not only do they want to do well, but they also want to make sure that their investments are doing well to the society, to the environment and climate change. So... Uh, we now know and we see that trend, and that's also why sustainable investing is one of the biggest financial trends of the past few decades in this industry. We have about a 12 to 15 percent growth uh, on an annual basis in Europe. Um, they've been doing this for a long time, and now Asia and the U.S. is also is also waking up. But it also has to do with increased regulation on how to um, how corporations and investment firms are are also doing their regulations and what they're disclosing in their in their reports and what they have to focus on. So for instance, in Europe and in Sweden, there are very high standards on what you need to report on from a, an environmental and social, social aspect. So what this all boils down to is that now you can, as an individual, also drive change in this in this area, the, the role of finance in the world is to allocate capital. And we now have the tool to make sure that we allocate capital towards the corporations who are the most sustainable um, in the world, who are driving action also in the climate change area. So it's up to us uh, to put pressure on, on investment companies, pension funds, and we can direct our money, the capital to drive change in this world. Happy to answer any questions you might have later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. <laughs> we will speak to you again during the panel session. I think we all agree that the financial system can be fundamental for a transition towards a less carbonized and more sustainable society. But how about you? How about your pension? Can your private savings make any difference? Here to lay that out for us is our next guest, 
Dan Old. Dan Old is co-founder and portfolio manager and advisor at UK-based Purposeful Money. And Dan, you will be asking, could your investments be damaging the planet? Please roll the video. Hi, I'm Dan, co-founder of Purposeful.Money here on the south coast of England. My message today is about money, the root of all evil and the thing which makes the world go round. The problem is the current economic model is not sustainable. We're destroying the environment that we depend upon. But why is this happening? More importantly, what can we do about it? I'll use some figures from the UK to illustrate some points. Each year, an estimated £9.7 billion is given to charities by people in the UK, which is fantastic. It shows that people are socially conscious enough to donate their money for the greater good. Surprisingly, the same population holds over £2,000 billion in pension assets, which has largely been unscreened for things like fossil fuels. Money is invested, broadly speaking, the same way it always has been. Your money is given to somebody to invest, and they invest it for growth or income, perpetuating business as usual with all of its downsides. This is happening because people simply do not know that their money is part of the climate problem, or more importantly, that it could be part of the solution. Think of your own money. Do you know where it's invested? Can you say absolutely that it's not invested in fossil fuels? So what can we do? Our message to everyone is that we can work within the existing system. We can be a catalyst for real change. Anyone can help move the market, young or old, rich or poor. You have a choice as to how and where your money is held. We're asking you to take control. Take 10 minutes to speak to your bank, your pension provider, your advisor. Tell them, I care about climate change and I don't want my money supporting the fossil fuel industry anymore. You might not get the perfect solution, but it'll be a step forward, helping change attitudes in the investment industry. Simply by asking, you'll be sending a message to the market and helping redirect it. Let's see if we can get in touch with uh, Smart um, Shukuma Amefula in Nigeria. Smart, are you with us? This gentleman is the climate reality leader and the CEO of Climate Transformation and Energy Remediation Society. A smart will, among other topics, if we get in touch with him, talk about food shortage as a result of climate change in Nigeria. Do you? Can you hear us now? We have a problem. Maybe you have your microphone on it's mute. unmute. You have to unmute your microphone. Hang on, you just need to unmute it because we can't hear you and I think it's... Um if you try to take your earplugs out uh, of your computer, it might work. Oh, we can't hear you, sir. Sorry. I'm so sorry, but I, we, we have no sound. I'm sorry about this. We have to move on. Let's see if we can get you into the panel. Uh, Let's because work we're on setting it. up a panel and we, we have some, so a couple of minutes, um, so maybe we can bring him in there. Yes, and in this panel discussion, we have a, a lot of people joining. We will, uh, if we <laughs> get in touch with him, uh, talk to Smart Chukuma Mafula, Dan Old, Maria Mal, Peter Carter, and Elizabeth Woodworth with us here in the studio. We also have Helena Lindemark. Hey, well. Welcome back. Mr. Amafula, and um, let's start with, I have a question for Elizabeth and, and Peter. Um, we, we read your message as both, well, mostly Hello. alarmistic, but also harmful. Hello. Hello. Okay. We can I hear can you. hear you now. Oh, oh, you can hear us now. All right. I also want to say yes. uh, welcome to Heliana, who is with us here in the Yes, studio. yes, yes, of course. Heliana Lindemark. Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. Wow. Technology wonders. Right, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe we should start with a question to you, Mr. Mr. Uh, Amafula. We're facing yes, some please. serious threats. How, and how do we challenge ourselves and, and the leaders to emit less greenhouse ga gases? Um, exactly. Um, back here in Nigeria, we have a, we have a lot of uh, policy documents like NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution, and Agricultural Map Plan of the country. But yep. unfortunately, most of these uh, um, strategies are remaining only on paper. They are not being implemented. So the, one, of the, one of the ways we can get them to do is to begin to take action. Like uh, the, the, the challenge here is that most people in Nigeria do not know about the uh, existence of climate change. And they are feeling it directly and indirectly as it is affecting um, um, food security here. Mm. Um, especially in the northern part of Nigeria, where agriculture is mainly practiced, 
And uh, right now, because of extreme temperature in the, in the in northern part of Nigeria, there is a lot of drought. Hmm. The, there is no more vegetation to feed the house or even to practice agricultural agriculture. As a result, the farmers, especially the herders, tend are forced or compelled to move their house southwest where there are enough vegetation and enough water to feed their house. And in doing so, they are encroaching into people farms and these are causing a lot of conflicts. So yeah. what, we, what we have been saying here is that we want our government, both in Nigeria and the rest of Africa, to jump out all beautiful, smart uh, um, um, climate change adaptation strategies they have of a lot of policy documents and begin to put them into practice. So we are demanding action because there is no more time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, okay. yeah. And, and let's jump over to Elizabeth and, and Peter. Um, your messages were quite alarmistic, but also it has some, some hope in it. And can we really be asked to step up to the challenge in our roles as citizens for change? Or is it the policymakers, the politicians? And, and or where does the responsibility for bringing on the change lie? Um, I'd like to answer that question. There's been a lot going on about mobilization, which isn't in the media. And it's because the public isn't being informed, as I mentioned in my earlier slideshow. Mm. Uh, they're not being informed about what must be done. So what we need is an alternative media, which you people might be able to launch on your platform that informs the public about what they need to do. And once they understand that, uh, they have all kinds of tools at their disposal. And one of them is civil disobedience. And it's really interesting that on March 27th, a judge in Boston exonerated 13 climate protesters, pipeline protesters. Um, they were not guilty because of the necessity defense. And that's a, a, a first. It's never happened before that people who broke the law were allowed to break the law because it was more important to protect the climate than to break the law. And three hours later, that was broadcast uh, by the independent um, uh, journal in London. And Bill McKibben then tweeted it. Hmm. And then it got out to the ecological community. No newspaper in the United States or Canada reported this event no. and until the New Yorker reported it on April 3rd, which was a whole week later. Mm. So we've got a situation, uh, really it's a war. It's a war between the, what uh, uh, Jeffrey Sachs was saying, these vested oil interests and the, the, the networks of the corporatocracy that control the, what's going on in the media and the, the citizens, which are not allowed to know which, what's going on. Mm. So... We, um, we. You encourage now, people to use the social media to spread yes, the world indeed. a lot more. We actually have uh, a, a that's one of the tools. Yeah. yeah. We actually have a Twitter question uh, for you to to Elizabeth and Peter, and it says, uh, "What resonates with people is personal threat." You can ask briefly on this one. Should we change the name from global warming to climate cancer? What What's your take on that? To climate cancer. To climate. To climate cancer. Name. Climate <laughs> cancer. Climate cancer. Well, um, if you look at the, um, if you look at planet Earth as uh, Mother Earth or you know living being like the indigenous people have always done, um, yeah, it doesn't look like a cancer. In actual fact, um, you had a really good uh, movement um, some years ago from Carl Henry Rebet in Sweden. And uh, he was a cancer researcher. Mm. And because of the similarity which he saw of all the industrialization and the fossil fuel outputs affecting and being globalized in the whole planet, he actually did liken it to a cancer. He started a very good movement in Sweden um, called the Natural Step. So, yeah, and I, you know, we have to call things as they are, right? So, really almost by definition, but certainly by the evidence, um, the, our economy, because it's fossil fuel driven, which means that it's poisoning the air, yeah. right? Killing 5 million people every year, um, uh, poisoning the ocean, acidification from CO2. And of course, it's building up 
this um, lagged, this, um, this, uh, this terrible harm which is going to affect us in the future. So that sounds like a malignancy, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Thank you so we much. We're moving on. You have a question for Helena, I know. Yeah, we, have, we were <laughs> raising a question for Helena and, and, and maybe for Dan as, as, um, as well. Um, do you see hope for, for climate leadership in, in the grassroots movements? Or is there hope and where is it in that sense? Yes, there is hope. Finally, we are doing something mm. uh, to solve these problems. I mean, we've known about this for quite some time. And as everybody, a lot of people mentioned before, uh, we have the, all the things that happened in 1972. Uh, and also in 1962, uh, this book came out, uh, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And that is actually the reason why I came up with the idea to start this 2022 initiative. Uh, already in 62, uh, Rachel Carson writes about what is actually happening now. Uh, and um, I can really recommend this book. Uh, now, finally, we have internet, we have social media, we can communicate with each other uh, more easily, and we can get action. Uh, from citizens around the world. And, and what, we're, what we're seeing now is particularly action, I think, from uh, so social entrepreneurs. Uh, because, I mean, in, in those global goals that we have, 17 global goals and uh, 169 targets, there are at least uh, 169 or probably 100 times more uh, different business ideas mm. to actually deal with. Growing out of that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. thank you and thank to all of our panel members. We are moving on. Thanks to the audience for asking questions. Now, some real action. And our next speaker and guest saves the environment by running. Yes. And his <laughs> name is Erik Huss and he just he just arrived here. A little yeah. bit warm. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you Eric, you, you're a part of an organization called Plogga, and you also brought some um, of, of the plastic bags and items that is actually part of the Plogga movement. Yeah. Can you tell me what is Plogga and how did it start? Well, uh, uh, actually, it's an old friend of mine. He, uh, a couple of years ago, he'd been living in the Swedish mountains uh, in a mountain village called Åre. He Where I come from. <laughs> Excellent. You the see, world is small. it's a small world. I'm born there. So he came back to Stockholm and he was devastated by all the trash he saw, and he said, "We have to do something." And he started. You know, he's a kind of godfather of trail running in Sweden. So he always runs in nature and streets. And he so well, uh, start picking trash while running. So pick and jog in Swedish is uh, plocka and jogga means uh, pick and uh, pick and jog. So we came up with the word plocka. And uh, he started doing that uh, one and a half years ago, and uh, and it spread through uh, like a movement in Sweden along trail runners, and uh, international TV teams came to Sweden uh, and saw this, and suddenly it was just spread you know, through Germany, uh, France, United States. What do you think it, it goes viral, but like that? Is it because the 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 view that foreign countries has on Sweden or? Is it the need of doing that, this that, stuff? That's a million dollar question, because there are so many clever things going on. Yeah. But this just gained speed very quickly. And it was actually a German TV team, and uh, they gained more than 20 million viewers, and it spread like... Uh, 20 million viewers? 20 million viewers, just like that. That's great. And they translated into German. Uh, and uh, it went hype, uh, like so many people go running. And uh, people, so many people uh, are tired of all the trash, and it's so easy. And for sure, it's less trash behind you than in front of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the idea is to go jogging and picking up stuff that you yeah. find. Yeah, right. true. So, and so also the facts around it. It's, uh, when I read about it, it's 85% of the of the trash in the oceans mm -hmm. come uh, from from the from beginning the from the land. Okay, so people don't throw through the trash rivers. In the no, oh. no. Normally you throw it on land, and then it through rivers and rainfall and winds ends up in the oceans. Mm. So it's a very efficient way to pick it up first mm. be before it, uh, it comes into the watersheds. What does it look like? 
I know you have a video. Oh yeah, what what you what yeah, did you yeah, bring yeah, here? Yeah. Or yeah. maybe is that good? <laughs> we can take it now <laughs> or later. Like, let's take the movie first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Movie first. Keep that secret it for, looks a like this. Yeah. for a while. Yeah. Let's watch the movie. Now that we're looks, curious. Yeah, that Aren't looks we? nice. But so, what did you find? What What do you find a Sunday yeah, afternoon well in Stockholm? Ju actually, just on the way from the subway, to here, it's two blocks. Mm -hmm. I found uh, actually one pleasant thing: a flower, <laughs> <laughs> uh, organic, and uh, yeah, it's a potato, plastic, uh, queso, Swedish cottage cheese, uh, ice cream. Uh, a lot of plastics. Lo a lot of plastics, yeah, plastic coffee, uh -huh. a lot of these cups from, you know, single-use cups from uh -huh. coffee shops. It's uh, all over. At least it's paper. At least it's paper. Cat food. <laughs> well, not paper. Metal. Uh, yeah, we see it's paper, chewing gum, Snickers. There's a lot of advertising here. And of course, these mm. all over. Mm. It's warning signs and it's all those used cigarettes, but I didn't pick up the cigarettes. Old party. Now you have some smart solutions to, to all these plastic waste as well. It's some solutions. Uh, and uh, you know, when you pick it up, uh, we always try to uh, recycle it. Yeah. yeah. So then it comes, I mean, it's 500 million years old. It, this is not trash. You know. It's, a, it it's, it's used, uh, yeah. valuable. Mm -hmm. We should see it as a resource really, and valuable. Really. Really worth that. money. So it's actually a Swedish company that can take care of all this mm. and they can spin dry uh, the textiles without water and chemicals and they use all only recycled materials and it's a jacket. It's made out of trash. So that so this, jacket this well, that turns orange, into that jacket. Just, yeah. just, just by occasion. Uh. But all the plastic you can use like this and this vest from a Swedish brand. It's also made of a completely recycled yeah. material. Oh, Thank you that so brings much. You, hope. you can make a change. Yeah, uh, that makes it really inspiring. Bring some hope. Are you a plugger? I need to be, I said. I, I am go, one. I'm running, I'm, I'm going by bike and it's frustrating to stop. But it's easy if you go jogging, of course, to pick up things than if you ride bring your bike. Bring my kids. It's a great thing to do with your I need family. To start. I yeah. need to start. Right. Okay, let's move. Thank you very much, oh, Thank you so much, Thank you. Eric. We would now like to introduce Daniel Lund. And Erik uh, Daniel Lund, he's the founder and CEO of Aidbox. And Aidbox is working on email signatures for a good cause. And uh, welcome very much. Welcome, good to have you here. And um, the stage is yours, so uh, yes. we're leaving you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hi everyone. Um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about how everyone can make a difference. And this is by a simple thing, yet with great impact by utilizing something that most of us use every day, which is our email signature. We have built a platform that helps raise awareness for charities around the world, uh, raise awareness around their important work. Uh, so today we're happy to announce that we have partnered with We Don't Have Time. To be an act for you to act on on their platform, raise awareness about the climate crisis. About 15 years ago, and I don't know if you remember this, but a little green tree started to pop up in people's email signatures. It looked something like this. Next to the little tree was a slogan that said, please don't print this email, save the trees, save the environment, think before printing. This campaign really took off and spread like wildfire. Since start, millions and millions of emails have been sent with this important message. 
So we at Aidbox thought, let's take this to the next level uh, with today's modern technology. So I'm happy to introduce to you how it looks today. Aidbox is a small little image that you paste into your email signature. You do this once. It contains a message from we don't have time about the climate crisis. So it allows you as a user to raise awareness and create impact every time you email. But let's go back to that little tree again. And to celebrate Earth Day today and our partnership, we wanted to take this a little bit further. Thanks to our partnership with Trine, who we heard from earlier today, talking about their investment in Africa and solar energy, we wanted to make something a bit extra. So we will carbon compensate every email being sent from today and forward, containing an aid box. Trine will offset the emissions by investing back into solar energy. We think this is pretty cool and allows you to say that your email is actually green. So I urge you, and please join us, go to wedonthavetime.com or aidbox.org, and a few simple steps, you can get your own aidbox, put it into work in your email signature, and let's raise awareness around the climate crisis. You might think that one email is not much, but if 100,000 people can join us, that would equal to about 12 million times we will carry this message. And that's 12 million times per month. I call that a difference. So please join us and get your aid box today. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. That's amazing how s small things can make a difference. Yeah. But uh, of, as you say, if there are many of them, they will make we a difference. We usually say that nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something, right? Do something. That thing is true. Oh. Thank you very much. You. And uh, now it's time for another round table session. It is. is it? And in this panel discussion, we will meet Dan Old, Maria Mal, Peter Carter, Elizabeth Woodworth, Daniel Lund, and Helena Lindemark. Welcome to all of you once again. We've met you before. This is nice. Unfortunately, I think we lost Smart Shukuma Amefula. He's out in the in, the, in space In somewhere. the cyberspace. In the no, cyber. He's, 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 he's in, he's he, in oh, there. He's there. We'll see <laughs> if we can stay in touch smart. Yeah. I really hope we can do that. Welcome also to you, of course. Uh, I have a question for Elizabeth and Peter. Uh, your book is kind of a manual for how to transform society. Given recent facts and experience, experience, how can we best mobilize and take action against climate change today, Elizabeth and Peter? <laughs> Uh, I think the first thing that we need to do is find a way to inform the public. They, like, they can't be mobilized unless they know. And there, there are two ways of approaching it. One would be if the governments had the mobilization. And there is a, an outfit called the Climate Mobilization on, on, online. And they're tr promoting a World War II model for governments taking the lead in, in uh, basically fighting World War III against climate um, bad behavior, basically, and a transition. Like we could transition all the oil companies, if the government ordered it, they could transition them, leave the employees there and, and uh, transition the oil companies at 10% a year to renewables. They'd keep their jobs. There wouldn't be resistance to the idea so much as if oil was simply banished. And, and we'd have um, within eight or nine years, if you compound that, we'd have zero carbon coming from them. So that's one. Uh, now, nobody ever talks about subsidizing oil companies to move to renewables, but that's a big idea that governments could pursue. On the other hand, if people are going to pr pursue a mobilization, that means climate campaigns like the types that uh, Bill McKibben with a 350.org and the um, Citizens Climate Lobby, which is Dr. James Hansen, um, there are these campaigns, there are divestment campaigns, there are pension fund divestment campaigns. There are so many things that people can do, but first they need to get through this media silence that we've got. And that's why I think that you guys are such an important platform because you could be the go-to place for what's actually happening and what could happen. <coughs> That's what we hope for. Dan Old, we have a question from a, a Twitter user. Uh, how can the accessibility of carbon-free pension funds be improved? Why aren't they widely available for company pensions in the UK? 
Um, I think I'd echo um, what the other guys just said. People don't really know about them. Okay. They are there. Mm. They are available. Um, yeah. If you, if you're in if you're in the UK and you're wanting to do this, I'd I'd mm. suggest Google Ethical Advisor. You'll find somebody in your area. Um, you could just walk into your bank um, and just say, you know, I don't want my money invested in fossil fuels anymore. What mm. are my options? And take the conversation from there. There's, there are options out there, but I think the problem is it hasn't been a big part of the uh, of the conversation. Yeah, you have how, to, how do you uh, bring that hope to people? I people have said that, and you can you can read it on the internet or on newspapers, etc. You just go to your bank man, and you you tell him or her what you want to do and how you want to change. But I feel that people aren't really moving in that direct, that that direction. I think they feel like, what does it matter what I do? Because they're Billions, literally, of other people out there. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't take very many people to start shifting the market. If you have um, you know, a relatively small amount of people, one or two or three percent of people selling shares yeah. um, in a company, that will have a big effect. So, you know, as individuals, we do have quite a lot of power. There are organisations um, uh, I'm sure you guys are aware about where. Um, you can lobby the pension fund, or you can lobby the the, uh, the government who'd be running a pension scheme. But at an individual level, you you do have that choice. You do have options. Certainly in the UK, I'm obviously not so sure about outside the UK, but certainly within the UK, and I'd imagine it would be the same for mm -hmm. um, the US and Europe. Maria, uh, no. may I? Yeah, sure. uh, on the <laughs> topic, ahead. Maria, uh, should the financial markets be regulated to increase sustainability, do you think? Or should finan financial players simply behave differently? Or where's the solution there, do you think? I think that what we see now is uh, a voluntary shift towards more sustainable investments. Uh, because we now know, as I said earlier, there is a, if you integrate sustainability uh, factors into your investment process that can actually drive better returns. So that that's one uh, perspective. But then we also see that, for instance, the the pension fund of of Norway is uh, is di is going more towards renewables and and not investing in fossil. Uh, companies, etc. So that's another push, and at the same time, you also have regulation coming from uh, from the government, as is the case in Sweden. So I think right now uh, the mix between um, uh, investor consumer demand paired with uh, more regulation and actually the investment uh, companies themselves seeing the benefits of this it's it's a great nexus because regulation alone will never drive this. Okay. Uh, so I think we're on the way, but we need to accelerate that transformation. And that goes back to transparency, information, but also starting to ask simple questions as a, as a, a private individual sitting down with your, with your financial advisor. That, will, that can start quite a lot. And yes. today we do have the opportunity that you can easily change your, uh, your uh, mutual funds, etc. In a, in a case that was unheard of just for about a couple of years. So it's also about you as, a, as an individual. Start asking those questions and demand them because they are available. Mm. Thank you. And that also creates then a demand in the financial community. And then communicate to the rest of the world and your friends what you've asked and what exactly. the results has been and, and try to make them move their feet exactly. as well. Exactly, and that's also why, why we at Arabesque, we've, uh, we created a tool that's called S-Ray, yeah. uh, a play on X-Ray so that you can actually see what your mutual funds and how your corporations are doing. And that's available for free on our website for everyone to use. Yes, uh, I have a question for you, Helena, here in the studio. Uh, you want to mobilize people on sustainability issues. Uh, that's perhaps... Uh, mo uh, most important. How do people see that their actions matter? So you were talking about this uh, just now, uh, and start also take action even with like small steps. Mm. Well, uh, one uh, problem to, um, now is that people are not aware of the global goals, for example. But uh, through uh, initiatives like this one, uh, we can change that. Uh, for climate change and also. 2022 initiative for the global goals, uh, and one of the main uh, or the main uh, issue in the global goals is leave no one behind, and through using uh, social media, uh, internet of things, and, and those things, we can actually uh, involve people and uh, have everybody engaged in doing and something. I, I mean, both you, Eric, and you, Daniel, you represent 
the action might be so small uh, and maybe meaningless yeah. for some, but if what did you say? <laughs> no one, no can, one do can do everything. Yeah. Yeah. Can so, do what's your mm. thoughts on this topic? No, I, I really believe that that statement. Uh, yeah. I, I think if we all sit and wait, you know, nothing's really going to happen. Mm -hmm. We can't rely on, as we talked about during the whole conference, about you know governments, uh, you know, doing the work for us. Um, and it was really interesting to hear about, you know, that governments are always uh, short term. So it's mm. hard to have a long-term vision. Mm. Yep. So I, I think it is up to us, individuals, entrepreneurs, uh, to, to pitch movements. in. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, th mm. I think you are a good example of what you can do when you can inspire. A pe people can do what you have suggested. And of course, you are inspirations for others to do things as well, to be innovative and bring up right. their ideas. And mm. Yeah, mm. I, I, I don't say that we do all the difference. I'm just saying that we are enabling Right. Exactly. I'm creating a platform for people to make the difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. What a good way to end this panel session. We are ah, oh, very close. We're to very close to say goodbye, but not, uh, not just really yet. yet like not just that. yet. Thank you so much again, dear panelists and keynote speakers. Smart Amafula, Donia Lund, Maria Mel, Elizabeth Woodworth, Peter Carter, Dan Old, and Helena Lindemarik. Mm. Because you know what? We're getting closer to the end. We yeah, are. this is the end. This is the end. We've the been end of the world. doing this since three o'clock for about four hours. Yeah. It's not so bad. Uh, the end of the 2018 uh, We Don't Have Time Climate Conference. I am a bit worried still, but I'm also hopeful. And I hope that we have inspired you who have been watching this to act for a better climate. Uh, I have a tricky question for you. Mm -hmm. Do you know who Winston Churchill was? Yeah. <laughs> Not so tricky question. I want to. <laughs> now comes the tricky question. Okay. <laughs> no, I just want to round up with a very simple quote from him: "Never give in. Never, 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 never give in." That's true. That's true. Together we can do this. I think. I hope we have to. I mean, that's the only option. Yeah. Failure is no not an option. B. Failure is not an option. All right. Okay. And um, to round off this conference, we have to. Well, we will get a final word from. The CEO of We Don't Have Time, Ingmar Rensog. And um, thanks. Thank you so much for us. Thank you. I'd like to finalize this conference with a personal story. Before that, I would like to thank Martin and Julia. You have done a fantastic job to host this conference. I would also thank, uh, I'd like to thank our partners, Trine, Aidbox, Business Insider, and the 2022 Initiative Foundation. All our keynote speakers around the world, panel members, and of course, the team behind this conference. It has been an Incredible hard work for many weeks, and we did it. Good work. I'm really proud of everyone that helped us here today. Finally, I would like to thank all of you that have been watching this conference online all over the globe. Thank you so much. So back to my personal story. I remember this clearly as yesterday. It was a beautiful summer day at the beach. The sun was shining. I was with my big family. I was six years old. And the weather was so nice that I were lying on an air mattress by the ocean. It was so comfortable that I fell asleep. Suddenly, I woke up. Someone were screaming. I think it was my mother. I have been sleeping for two hours and I had no sun protection and I had a back that was really hurting. I got second degree burn damage on my skin. But it was not the pain that I remember today that gave the strongest impression. It was something the grown-ups were talking about that gave me anxiety that I still have today. They were talking about something up in the sky. 
the ozone layer. And what he said was that we humans had done something that were destroying this layer of protection. And the anxiety was that we humans had done something to the nature that had done it dangerous to ourselves. This beautiful summer day were suddenly really dangerous. But there is a good end to this story, because two years later, in 1987, the world leaders came together in Montreal, Canada, to stop the ozone crisis. They decided to forbid the chemical freons that causes the problem. We don't miss freons today. The younger generation, I don't think they even remember what freons was for. But if they hadn't done that back when, the situation today would be totally different. We couldn't go outside and show naked skin here today. We would be living in a totally dark and dangerous world. But we don't, because the ozone layer is healing. And the fact is, in the year 2050, the scientist says that the ozone layer will be totally healed. Next week, on Thursday, my own oldest daughter turns six years old. And if we don't stop the climate crisis from now, she will, when it's my age, 40 years from now, have a very dystopian and difficult future. A future without hope. But there is hope. We have already started. Three years ago, the world leaders came once again together, this time in Paris, where they agreed on to stop the climate crisis. But so far, too little is being done too slowly. No political, no country or world leader will do enough. We need to hurry up. We must all, as citizens on Earth, step up and come together to fulfill the Paris Agreement, put pressure on our countries, on our companies, and change our own way of living, lead by example to solve the climate crisis. Let's begin today. Let's start a revolution, a viral movement, where we challenge ourselves and our loved ones, colleagues and friends. And my challenge and climate resolution is this. My name is Ingmar Renzog and I'm the founder of the climate organization We Don't Have Time. I strongly believe that we who work every day to save the planet also walk the talk. Therefore, my climate resolution is that I will not go by airplane for at least one year to save carbon emission. I will also try to change all my investment to be fossil free. I would like to challenge other leaders that also work every day to save the planet. My challenge goes out to Jeffrey Sachs, Katie Orlando, and all my fellow climate reality leaders, including Al Gore. What is your climate resolution to lead by example? Now you can make your own resolution, spread our love, climate bombs and change the world. Visit wedonthavetime.org and use our tools, use your voice, use your power, power. You can be the change. Thank you very much and see you again.